Hey, what's up everyone? Mecca here, and today we're gonna do a Fire Emblem Oifi and Jagan tier list. You guys really liked the Christmas Cavalier list that I did for Christmas. So I was like, you know what? If you guys like it, I'm happy to do more. And there were some comments suggesting, you know, you should do the Jagans and Oifis next, so that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, if there's any other archetype you want me to take a look at, then post them down below, and I'll take a look at it. And, well, as I said, this time we're doing Jagans and Oifis. What I mean by that is, um... We promote that join really early, like basically the first one or two chapters is kind of the logic I went with, roughly. Like, it's hard to really classify archetypes like this, you kind of get into, you know, is this really a Jagan, is this really um, a Gordon or whatever you want to call it. But I've decided, the people I put in here, I count them as Jagan sort of. I know there's some odd picks in here, but I'll get to those as I go over them. Uh, but, as you might expect, these units, none of them are bad. Uh, just like the Christmas Cavaliers, except they're even better. Some of them are the best units in their respective games. Some of them are a little below that, but generally these are very, very powerful units. It wasn't always this way. Uh, not everyone agreed on these way back for sure. Uh, some of the most controversial units in here, in fact, uh, people used to think of Jagans as like XP thieves that you should just use as meat shields or bench as soon as possible because they would stunt the growth of your army. Uh, nowadays, people know better. Um, some people think this is because of me. Uh, I would like to think I helped spread the word on how good these units are, but I learned it from other people too. I learned it from people on those uh, Fire Emblem 4 and debate forums, uh, specifically Raken and Katz. They really showed the light on these units, so those are the people you really have to thank for this. And thanks to those, I was able to spread the knowledge, spread the word that these units were actually really good. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. So I got um, FE3 Aaron in here, Sigurd, Oifi, Avel, Dagdar. Uh, both for forms of Marcus, Seth, Titania, Soth, um, Jagan, Aaron, Frederick, Gunter, uh, Gerald, and <laughs> if you're wondering who this guy is, this is Siegfried from The Last Promise. So we're gonna rank them not based on like, how good they are compared to each other really, uh, more like how good they are within their respective games. Like, for example, Sigurd cannot rescue, um, but FE6 Marcus can, but that doesn't mean that FE6 Marcus is better than Sigurd, but rather it means that Marcus can do something that Sigurd cannot in his respective games, but that doesn't really mean everything. Basically, I'm going to rate Sigurd compared to his peers versus Marcus versus this peers, and which one of them stands out more, if that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, I'm sure it will during the list. So I got FE3 Aaron here, and I'm going to skip him for now because I'm, this is actually the Jagan that I have, a hardest, I have the hardest time ranking. Because I've only played through FE3 Book 2 like twice in my life maybe. And I didn't really use him extensively beyond the early game. I know he's fairly good. So I don't know exactly where I'm going to put him. But I'm going to start with some of the easier ones. Just so we have a frame of reference to where to put the others. Because uh, FE3 Aaron, he's a special case. We'll, we'll come back. We'll get back to it. But right away I'm going to put Sigurd here. Because I think the best way to put it is Sigurd is his own Jagan. You know, usually the Jagan figures are these like protective persons that protect the Lord from harm. Sigurd is the Lord of FE4 Gen 1. And he's also a pre-promote, and he's also really strong. He is easily... I wouldn't say he's the best in the entire franchise, but I would say he's the second best in the entire franchise. Um, maybe not after three houses, but I did put him in, like, number two in my top 15 best characters ever. And that's because Sigurd is just that damn good. Um, a lot of people would say, like, Sigurd can solo the game. Any unit can solo the game, but Sigurd has one of the easiest times doing it. And a lot of the time, having Sigurd take care of, care of things is the easiest thing you can do. Uh, ever. Uh, FE4 is very friendly to snowballing. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, good units, uh, as they get kills more often, they'll get stronger faster than units who have trouble getting kills, so that kind of has a self-escalating effect, if you get what I mean, where they get better faster. Uh, Secret will collect kills on weapons very fast, which will lead him to getting the critical skill, because if you get 50 kills on a weapon in FE4, uh, they will gain the ability to crit with that weapon, and that weapon only, otherwise they generally cannot crit. So that's one thing Sigurd can do really well because he gets killed so fast. Uh, of course, the reason he can do that is be just because his stats are that good. He has high strength, he has high speed. Um, he gains EXP like anyone else would at level 5. Uh, he joins like a slightly higher level than other people, but not really that much. Uh, usually Jagans are known for getting less EXP than other units. But a little known fact is that this didn't start happening until FE5, which is the game after Sigurd was introduced. So Sigurd gains EXP like a normal person. Uh, being promoted doesn't really change his EXP gain any. And that's great because it means he gets to grow pretty fast. Uh, he gets a holy weapon uh, near the end of generation 1, the tier thing, which is a very good weapon. Uh, makes him very good against mages because it gives him like plus 20 res, I think. Maybe plus 15, I don't remember. Either way, he doesn't take jack from mages in that case. But even before that, he's very good with like a silver sword or a brave sword. 
any TD you can give him will probably work. You can have one two rings with javelins, even though javelins are not that great in FE4, but Sigurd is so strong that he might be able to make it work. Uh, he's one of the better candidates with a speed ring. Uh, funnily enough, Sigurd can actually face zero hit against enemies as early as chapter one, uh, just by giving him a speed ring and having weapon triangle advantage. Uh, weapon triangle is a big deal for Sigurd. Uh, he has weapon triangle over axe users because he uses swords, and weapon triangle gets plus 20 hit and avoid in FE4. So you can imagine how well that goes. Of course, the fact that swords just don't weigh anything in FE4, uh, they weigh like 3 compared to lances which weigh 12, and axes which weigh like 18 or 20, is just insane. Sigurd, he just does all the best things. He is so powerful and so easy to use, and most of the Jagans they are known to fall off, but Sigurd only gets stronger because his growths are so good, uh, partially because of Holy Blood. Uh, Sigurd is one of the few units on this tier list that actually gets stronger and stronger as the game progresses. He never gets weaker. The others kind of fall off sometimes, but Sigurd, he never falls off. He's that good. So that's why Sigurd is going to be an S and he's probably going to stay on top for a while. Uh, now we got Oifi. Uh, the funny thing about Oifi is he actually has a whole archetype name after him, and I suspect it's mostly by people who have never played FE4. And the reason I say that is because uh, there's like a distinction that people make often, uh, or often make, where they, they separate these pre-promotes between Jagans and Oifis. And Oifis are supposed to be the ones that do grow like Sigurd does. Uh, basically Jagans with good growths. Whereas Jagans, the idea of a Jagan is generally, uh, they start off strong but they fall off because their growths are worse. And the funny thing is Oifi has decent growths but they're worse than most of his peers because most of his peers are the FE4 Gen 2 kids and just a lot of people with Holy Blood. And Oifi's growths, they're alright but they're not fantastic and he will not be your best unit for a very long time. He does start off with a much higher level than the other, so he does actually gain less XP than most other people. Uh, but I think Oifi in, on his own is a very competent unit. Uh, very high base defense in particular, he's very bulky. And because he can use swords, and because this is FE4 Generation 2, where you have access to all the strong rings and weapons, it's very easy to make Oifi kill things. Uh, he has the critical and pursuit skills, which is really all you need to be a functional unit in FE4. In fact, all you need is pursuit. Uh, but like, he's on a horse, uh, horses are king in FE4. So you really can't go wrong with Oifi. He won't be like his stats won't be as ridiculous. He won't have the ridiculous skill set of like um, Larse or Lakshe, whatever you want to call it, or uh, he won't be like a whole steady user. But he's still really strong. He can still one round fairly easily. Like if you're willing to give him the hero sword, uh, he will kill everything. Of course, anyone can do that. So it doesn't make him as special as other people. But I would still say he's very good. He just doesn't stand out as much as some of the others. Uh, generally, FE4 Gen 2 has a lot of other powerful characters that Oifi doesn't really stand out from very much. But nonetheless, I think it's one of the better characters in FE4 Gen 2. Because he starts off with a horse, he doesn't need that many resources to be good. Funnily enough, he actually starts with uh, like the one weapon he can't one round kill with, the Armor Slayer, which is very weak in FE4, it has like 5 might or something. And, but if you try to set up kills for other people, you might find that he will accidentally crit. Uh, because he's one of the few people who can crit without you know getting critical on his weapons. So he will often like try to almost two hit kill an enemy, but not quite, to so set him up for like one of your kids that you're trying to train, and they'll just crit. So he, he kind of fails as a Jagan in that way. Of course, the fact that he kills people is still a good thing overall. You're just going to have to set up a kill differently. Uh, but that's why he doesn't really work in a way that people often want Jagans to work, which I think is kind of funny, but I don't think it makes him worse for the record. Uh, I think the best way to use Jagans is to just have him kill stuff if you need to, and if you don't need to, then use him to weaken people. And people who say that a Jagan who doesn't kill stuff is better than a Jagan who does kill stuff, I just think that's silly. Uh, you as a player have mostly full control over what does and doesn't get attacked by your Jagan, and you can make decisions accordingly. Anyway, rat aside, I'm gonna put Oifi in A tier. He's not nearly as good as Sigurd is. Um, like, Sigurd is a level on his own, uh, along with a couple of others that I'm gonna name, but Oifi is very good anyway. Um, Aethel is an interesting case. Um, she joins, like, right away in Chapter 1 of FE5. She's not a paladin, but she's a swordmaster, and she actually has more movement than most people anyway, so she might as well be a paladin. She's literally invincible in the early game of FE5. Uh, like, if you had her at low HP and you have an enemy attacker, they will never hit her, because she has a kind of a hidden miracle proc, basically, where she can never die. Uh, but even if she didn't have that, she'd be ridiculously durable, because she's so dodgy. Uh, she actually comes with 20 speed, which is the maximum you can have in FE5. Uh, she has a couple movement stars, leadership stars, she can use the fire sword, which is a 1 to range sword that deals magical damage at range and boosts your magic by 5, so it makes her very good for killing bosses, because bosses in FE5 are often on thrones or gates that give plus 10 defense, so they're very tough to hit and very tough to do damage to, but Avel just kills them. Uh, she has adepts because she's a sword master, um, so generally Avel will kill things she attacks, and that makes it like kind of annoying to weaken things for her. 
one small strike against her, besides the fact that she's unavailable for a lot of the game. I'm not gonna get into why, because spoilers. Uh, but one other thing that strikes against her, in my opinion, is that her peers around her are also pretty strong. Uh, like, you get some scrubs, like Leaf is pretty weak at, er, at first, the main lord, and there's a couple other people like Marty and Tanya who aren't very good, and Ronan who's also not very strong in the early game. Just you wait. But other than that, you have like Halvin, who almost one rounds enemies, crits a lot. You have Orson, who kills pretty much everything. You have Finn, who kills pretty much everything. Uh, you have Dakdar, who kills pretty much everything. He's also on this list, by the way. Um, people in FE5 don't really need the help as much as someone in like FE6, for example. So Aethel is not that much stronger than it appears, but she does shine at like boss killing, uh, being more mobile than them. Uh, she, she can capture some things. So she's still really, really good in the early game, don't get me wrong. Uh, but the lack of availability really hurts her. She comes, like, you can use her for a little bit late in the game. But at that point, she's definitely no longer your strongest unit. She's still more viable than a lot of people think, actually. She's not bad in the end game or anything. Uh, she still has that max speed. She can still use all the good swords. So she's not that good, but she loses out on a lot of availability. And for that reason, I'm going to not rank her, like, A tier. Because I think she's still really good when she's around. And, like, so good to the point that I think it's worth having her in this A tier. Uh, but she's not going to end up very high in this A tier, because a lot of the Jagans are going to be like either S tier or A tier. Uh, Dakdar is like Aethel, she joins very early on, or he joins very early on. I don't think Dakdar is a girl. He's very good though, very very powerful guy, uh, has immense HP. Uh, he can attack like four times with the Brave Axe, he's fast enough to double early on. He also has the Akast skill, which will let him uh, initiate another round of combat if at the start of combat his HP and attack speed are higher than the enemies. So if he's faster and he has more HP left at the start of combat, he can attack like 8 times with the Brave Axe. This makes him very good for capturing enemies, uh, basically forcibly rescue them and steal their, steal their inventory basically. And that's very nice. And he can be useful all game long. He does kind of dip later on as most pre promotes do. His growths are of course very terrible, uh, just like Avel's in fact. So he's not going to gain a whole lot, but his bases hold up for a very very long time. Uh, but a cost does hurt him because enemies can also proc it on enemy phase on him. He's gonna get like double by ballistas and like ranged magic that can kind of hurt him But nonetheless, I think he's uh, definitely better than Avel because he's just around for a lot longer time uh, He does leave but he comes back much earlier. Uh, I would say uh, Oifi is like the better endgame unit for sure. He's he's a lot stronger and like um, In a vacuum, I would say Oifi is better. Uh, I would say Dactar has a bit more utility though in the fact that um, if you're not going to use Oifi, you'll probably the next best unit will be a lot better than, you know, the same thing for Dakdar probably. I could see this go either way, honestly. Uh, FE6 Marcus is a lot of people's favorite Jagan because in hard mode he doesn't one round enemies, so he's perfect for setting up kills. And also in FE6 hard mode, you like you really need him. I would, I'm not saying you can't complete the game without him, but he makes it so so much easier to use him. And then uh, as the mid game comes around, like chapter nine or so. He gets a bit worse compared to other people, and they catch up. So that's a, that's a, like he is the epitome. That I pronounce it. I always mispronounce that word at least at least one word in a Fire Emblem video. Um, yeah, Marcus. I think F6 Marcus is what people like to use their Jig. This is the ideal of what they think Jig should be like. Uh, of course, that makes him a bit worse than uh, someone like Sigurd, who's just useful all game long. Uh, Marcus is good, but there's definitely a huge portion of the game where he's not very good. Uh, but still, I think just how much easier he makes FE6 early game puts him in a very high position. I would say overall, I would rather play FE6. Um, I would rather play FE4 without Oifi for sure than FE6 without Marcus, basically. He is not essential, but damn near essential. He is super, super useful. Like, just in Chapter 1, pretty much everyone is getting two-rounded by the enemies you face in FE6 Chapter 1 hard mode. Uh, Marcus gets, like, maybe four round killed or something. He almost kills him in return to the point where your other units can kill him. So he's perfect for baiting them, weakening them for enemy enemies. He's very useful, it's just he doesn't hold up for the entire game. But just his early game utility makes him really good in my opinion. Uh, then we have this FE7 incarnation. I'm gonna do something that you might find very odd, but I'm gonna put him in S tier behind Sigurd. Uh, FE7 Marcus starts off so strong. Also, I just noticed I, I moved the thing a little bit. Let me fix the dimensions real quick. There we go, that was weird. Okay, so FE7 Marcus. He uh, starts out stronger than everyone else, just like all your other Jagans. Uh, but he holds up pretty well as the game goes on. His main weakness is his speed, which is a little average, but he can still double a fair bit, even into FE7's mid-game, because the enemies are just so weak. And Marcus still has really good bases, honestly. Uh, despite the fact that his growths are kind of worse than everyone else's, they're not so much worse that you're going to notice until like you're pretty far into the game. 
And even there, he can be useful through like rescue utility or taking on mages because his resistance is far above average. Uh, one other thing that I haven't really talked about much is weapon levels. Marcus has much better weapon levels than everyone else. He has A lances, A swords, B axes. So he can use anything you want. You can use the brave weapons to make up for the fact that he doesn't double. Really terrifyingly powerful unit. So I think it's good enough. He doesn't dominate the entire game, but he's close enough to where I would field him almost the entire game. He's that good. Uh, he's definitely going to end up at like the bottom of S tier in the end when I put in the other super broken Jagan characters. But I would say Marcus is pretty damn good. Good enough to be a tier above the others. Like Marcus won rounds for, I would say, the entire early game pretty reliably. Uh, one of the better boss killers you have for sure. Uh, the use of the Silver Lance is just marvelous against bosses. He has... Uh, that's the main thing I like about Marcus, F7 Marcus specifically, is one to range with javelins and hand axes is so insanely broken in F7. And depending on the game you're playing, that is a very rare thing that Marcus has that these other people do not. Sigurd doesn't really have the greatest one to range. F6 Marcus doesn't have the greatest one to range. Oifi, nope. Dakdar, nope. Avel, yeah, with the fire sword. Uh, but Marcus has it for pretty much the entire game, and F like hand axes and javelins are just so good. Uh, the same goes for Seth, really. Uh, Seth is kind of like. Um, ridiculous. He's kind of like Sigurd. I'm going to put him here. Uh, Seth is actually the number three best unit of all time, I think, uh, before Three Houses came out. Because, again, he joins very early, but unlike Marcus, he has good growth, so he's just going to stay broken for the entire game. Uh, the one thing he has not that Marcus does have is access to axes. Yeah, which I'm pronouncing that like five times straight. Uh, he doesn't have access to hand axes because Paladin's lost axes in FE8, but honestly, it doesn't really hurt him very much. If at all, he does about the same as he would with axes. Uh, kills everything, but he stays good because of high growth. Of course, uh, this is at the point where uh, pre promotes do gain less EXP than other characters. Like that's been the case from like FE five and onwards. So that hurts him a little bit, uh, but he can still get boss kills and get like half a level from those, which is decent enough. And honestly, Seth, as long as you. You, yeah, I would not recommend you solo F8 with Seth unless you're specifically trying to solo F8 with Seth. Uh, you can do it if you want him to. I'm just saying you probably shouldn't kill everything with Seth if you want to have like a good balanced team. This goes for like all Jagans, but Seth specifically. Uh, but it is one of the more tempting ways to play F8 in the early game. Like if I play through F8 quickly to get like footage of something specific or something, I just solo the game with Seth because it's the fastest game, that, fastest way to do it. Uh, Seth is absolutely essential in any kind of fast run because he's just so. So goddamn powerful. And he holds up for the entire game. Like, even in FE8, 100% growth, the LTC that I did. Seth was just super important. Um, just a ridiculously insane, powerful character. Uh, Pre-promotes with bases that good shouldn't have growths that good. It's just that simple. Uh, I wish there was more to say about him than just high movement kills everything. But that's really the, the, the gist of it, of these strong pre-promoted units. Um, they can move in and they kill everything that's in sight. Plain and simple. Uh, kind of the same thing goes for Titania. She's uh, This is FE9 Titania, in case you couldn't tell. And I'm going to put her right... Um, I'm not sure whether to put her over or under Marcus, because I think Titania is a little less... Uh, she stands out a little less in the later stages. No, actually, I would say she's better in later stages, too. Let's scratch that. We're going to put her here. Um, Titania is from a game where Paladins, for some reason, they felt like buffing them even more. So, not only can Titania, as a Paladin... Uh, use multiple weapon types, whereas most infantry classes only get like one weapon type. Uh, she can move further than them because of her horse, and she gets access to Kanto after attacking. Uh, most mounted units in most games, they can um, they can use Kanto and like use the remainder of their movements after trading or after rescuing or after dropping, but they wouldn't be able to do it after attacking. Titania can't, so they make it even more broken like that. And FE9 also has an item called the Night Ward that boosts defense and resistance by two. Uh, which only Paladins, uh, I think, and Knights and Soldiers can use. And also boosts your speed growth by 30%. So anytime you're giving out bonus experience level ups to people, uh, you can just trade the Knight Ward to Titania. And she'll basically have 30% extra speed growth. So she'll be pretty fast. Uh, her growths are already good. They're basically as good as Seth's. And her bases aren't shabby either. She kills like everything. Um, as I'm recording this, Mangs is recording his FE9 Iron Man in Maniac mode. And Titania is, of course, completely dominating it. Absolutely bonkers unit, just like Seth. Um, just the ability to use lances and axes alone is super nice. High weapon levels, high stats. Nothing but praise for Titania. Very, very pretty character too. 
Uh, I should note real quick before I forget, uh, Secret also has Super Kanto, and so does uh, Oifi. So they can also, they can even switch their weapons after attacking, which is massively broken. Like, imagine killing something with a Hero Sword on player phase, and then switching to like a 1-2 range weapon like a Light Sword on enemy phase. That kind of stuff is just bonkers. People don't even abuse it as much as they should. <laughs> it's super, super good. Uh, and then we got Soth. Uh, once again, not a Paladin, but I do count him as like the Jagan of that game. Uh, because he's so much stronger than everyone else, he is pre-promoted, he has higher mobility, and he's even like a guardian figure to, to the main lord at that point, uh, Micaiah. So I think he definitely belongs here. Uh, Soth takes the whole start off strong and fall off, like, very literally. Or, not even literally, that's what Gunter does. But, like, he is so much stronger in part 1 than he is when you come back in part 3, and in part 4, he's absolutely dog shit. Terrible, terrible, terrible. But in the early game, he's like the main reason you can beat uh, if it's in hard mode as easily as you can because he can go through part one so fast and he is so much stronger than his peers because like the next most tankiest character in that team is Nolan and then beyond that you have like Aaron, uh, Micaiah, Edward, Leonardo, like they're such noobs. So is so much stronger and he's one of the few characters early on that has a good one to range or decent one to range so he's very good at fighting mages and archers. Uh, using like ranged knives, which you can forge by the way to give him more hit and more might if you want to. Uh, knives still have very low might and he can't use swords or anything like rogues can usually can. So that kind of sucks, but knives are okay, they're fine. He does well with them. Uh, the thief utility from being a rogue isn't really very much, there's not a whole lot of chests or doors to open. Uh, but that's something else he can do, I guess, if you want him to. But overall, I would say Soth is good for a good portion of the game. Radiant Dawn tiering is very tough because of the way the part system works, where you have different armies in different parts all the time, your team switches all the time, so a tier list of that game ends up looking very weird no matter what you do. I would say Soth, uh, I would rank him around here, I think, where he's good for like a little bit of the game, but not for the entirety of it, but he's so good for a portion of the game that he's still fairly decent. Uh, maybe put him below Dagdar, actually, thinking about it more, but again, I think Dagdar and Avel are way less... They stand out less than Soth does in part 1, so I think this is fair enough. I think this is great. So now you can see it will probably be much easier to rank Aaron once we get to him. Uh, but let's continue down the list here. So uh, this portrait is FE3 Jagan. This, for some reason this tier list maker doesn't have Shadow Dragon portraits on it. I don't know why. And there was only one Jagan in this whole thing that I could pick. So yeah, there's no FE1 portraits either. So I went with this Jagan as like a stand-in for Shadow Dragon Jagan. Because I know some people have played FE3. <laughs> a lot of people were kind enough to comment that on the last video. Uh, but Jagan, I'm gonna rank him as his Shadow Dragon counterpart and stick to that because uh, I'm most familiar with Shadow Dragon compared to FE3 and FE1, so it's easier for me to rank him that way. Uh, Shadow Dragon is a funny case where, um, uh, first off, he has like roughly the same utility as FE6 Marcus in the early game, where he stands out a lot among his peers. Uh, he's able to take on enemies and bait them safely to for you to kill them off. He actually does worse than almost every other Jagan early on because the enemies in Shadow Dragon are so much stronger in the hardest difficulty, Hard 5, I think it's called Merciless Mode. Uh, even with the Silver Lance, he doesn't one round and he doesn't double, he has very low speed, and of course very bad growth, so he's never going to improve. But he still does so much better than all your other characters that you kind of have to use him. I think enemies can finish off, uh, or you can finish off enemies after he's hit them with the Silver Lance, uh, but he has Weapon Triangle disadvantage when using that, and you can't use like any strong swords besides like the Steel Sword, which... I think it like maybe two shots, but I don't think it even does that. The enemies in their hard five are very, very tanky. Uh, but nonetheless, he's so much better than everyone else that you still want to use him a lot. So put him on a fort, and hopefully he survives and hits them enough to where you can kill them. Uh, the cool thing about Jagan though in Shadow Dragon is you can reclass him to a Wyvern Rider uh, after like chapter four or so, as long as you have a free slot for that, because reclassing is kind of limited in a way. And then you can use axes, which you can use the weapon triangle um, to like manipulate the weapon triangle for a little bit. Which is very nice. Uh, still won't double, uh, but he'll have more strength and defense. So if there's no archers around, you definitely want to go Draco Knight with him. And another cool thing is, like, in Shadow Dragon, his stats will probably fall off at some point a little bit. Uh, especially once you start promoting people. But he will still be useful for, like, pretty much the entire game because he's able to use Forge Weapons. And Forge Weapons in Shadow Dragon are so powerful. You can give him the Rider's Bane, and if you forge, like, four or five Might on it, then he can one it kill enemy Cavaliers for basically the entire game. Even Paladins, uh, depending on their stats and yours, uh, and like how much might you fort on it. 
So that way he can be useful for the entire game. I think that's the only effective weapon he can really use, but enemy cavaliers are so common in the Shadow Dragon that this is still a very useful thing to do. Because what you can do is you can trade the Rider's Bane between your different people. And between Sita with the Wing Spear, and then Jagan, uh, Abel, Harden, people like that. They can all trade around that Rider's Bane and take on an entire group of cavaliers at once, and that's just so useful to have. So I would say Jagan holds up for pretty much the entire game. Of course, he's going to be worse in the end, but he's still pretty nice to have. So I'm going to put him around, let's see. I'm not entirely sure if he's better or worse than FE6 Marks. You can see they look very similar. Uh, they have very similar utility. But I'd say Jagan holds up a little better into the late game. And that's why I'm going to put him here at the top of A tier. Uh, this is a Shadow Dragon Jagan. I'll briefly note about FE1 and FE3 Jagan. What helps FE1 and FE3 Jagan a lot is that enemies in those games are very weak. So their statistical deficiencies don't really affect them very much. Of course, they'll be worse than other people, because uh, those other people will double more reliably. And they won't like they won't juggernaut the whole game. But he'll still hold for, hold up very well. I think FE1 in particular has some very potent stat boosters that you can give him if you want to. That boosts their stats by an insane amount um, per use. Not saying they're the best user of it, but it's pretty easy to keep him up for the entire game. So now we've gotten to Aaron, both variants of it. Uh, this is the FE3 one, FE3 book 2. Uh, he's not a Jagan in book 1 because that's basically Shadow Dragon, so he joins like chapter 16 or something. But in FE3 book 2 and in New Mystery, he joins in chapter 1 of the main campaign. Of course, FE3 book 1. Book 2 doesn't have a prologue, but FE12 does. Either way, he joins early enough to be considered a Jagan, in my opinion. And he's kind of like Jagan in that he starts off better than everyone else, but he definitely falls off hard. FE12 is kind of safe by reclassing, it can stay relevant for a longer time, but definitely one of the worst ones on this list statistically. Still very useful just for the axis of promoting classes, of course. Forge Weaponry can no longer cheese FE3 or FE12 as hard as you can cheese um, like Cavaliers in FE12 or <laughs> FE11. I'm sorry, I'm messing it all up here. But the point is Forge Weaponry isn't as useful because there's more enemy variety. So you can no longer just one-shot everything with Forge Weapons. So I think that makes Aaron worse than Jagan for sure. He does stand out over his peers, but not that much. Uh, this one like is about the same, really. FE3 is about the same, I think, as FE12, all things considered. Because all the things that hurt him hurt their peers too. So I think they're about the same, really. So I'm going to put him around here for now. Uh, I'm going to say the, the new mystery version is a little better. Because... I think he stands out a bit more early on. Like if you if you play the higher difficulties, FE3 Book 2 doesn't have higher difficulties really. Everyone is about the same, so he doesn't really do very well compared to others. And the early game squad is like decent enough to hold up without him. He still stands out a bit, but compared to these others, not as much. Uh, but the new mystery in Lunatic, you're definitely gonna rely on Aaron quite a bit to keep you alive. I don't think the presence of someone like Sirius, uh, who joins very early and is also promoted pound and hurts him any, like. Being the best unit, being the only pre-promote, or being a pre-promote is not a niche in a way that like having more than one hurts their utility, gets you like diminishing returns. They're both very useful. Um, they both be about equally useful, even if the other one didn't join. So that's not gonna hurt him any. I just think they stand out a bit less. Maybe they could be considered better than Avel because of Avel's lack of availability. That I could see. I'm gonna move it like this. I love Avel though. Don't get me wrong. Do it for Avel, but yeah. Frederick, uh, Awakening is, as I've said last video, it's the, the Fire Emblem game I have the least experience with out of all these, probably, uh, besides like Fates, I guess. So, excuse me if this one is going to be horribly wrong. I have tried out Awakening Lunatic, I know that Frederick is ridiculously useful there. So for that alone, I think it should go like around here, or maybe even here. Uh, I know his growths are very good, I just know Awakening growths in general are very good. But I'm not entirely sure how to rank him because I have so little experience. I just know he's very essential to clear some of the early game chapters, particularly chapter 2, which is a very, very hard chapter to clear. I know his pair of bonuses that he gives are very strong. I know that you have to basically use Frederick to babysit you until Robin, and to a lesser extent, Krom, and maybe someone else you're raising is able to hold their own, but mostly Robin. Uh, Awakening Lunatic, as far as I know, is all about making Robin strong enough to hold his own, and from there, just using Robin and Lunatic, Robin and Frederick to keep everyone alive, but... You better pick a god and pray, because Frederick is goddamn essential early on. Now, for the early, easier difficulties, of course, Frederick, I think, still holds up fine. I do know that in the mid-game, Frederick stops doubling, basically, and he becomes more useful as, like, a stat backpack. It's like a pair of bot than anything else. He can be very nice uh, in the mid-game to use, uh, like, 
War Slayers with him. I forgot what they're called in that game. Beast Slayer, I think. As long as he can use effective weaponry in some kind, he can still hold his own, kill like riding enemies, flying enemies, that kind of stuff. As long as he has enough might behind him. That could make him useful still. I'm not entirely sure where to place him. Maybe he should be down here instead. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Because like... He's, he has like the level of early game utility that these guys have, like uh, the Jagans, uh, like the actual Jagans, but he doesn't have the, he does sort of have the stats that these guys have, because his growths are so good, but then again everyone else's stats are also really good, so I'm not entirely sure, so let me know what you think. Uh, Gunter, I have like almost no experience using this guy, I'm playing Revelations right now, oh no. And Gunter hasn't been great as, you know, a person to fight with, but he has been useful as a stat backpack. Now, that is, of course, a very low thing compared to what all these people are doing. And as far as I know, Revelations is where Gunter is best, where he has the most availability. I do know he joins late in Conquest. I basically didn't use him other than the chapter where you're kind of forced to. But other than that, I don't find Gunter very useful in any of his incarnations. So I'm going to make him the only Jagan that I'm going to put in B tier. Of course, the, the version in Conquest isn't really a Jagan anyway, other than his early game appearance. In that way, I guess he gets like Ava like abil availability, a little bit better. But his stats just don't hold up well. I think he's just meant to be a pair of bot. So I'm going to put him here. Now I have two oddities left that I wanted to put on here as like a little bonus. So Geralt is not actually a Jagan in Three Houses. He is around as an NPC in a couple of maps, as like to babysit you a little bit, but you can't control NPCs. This is like, I just wanted to think a little bit about like how good Geralt would be if he joined you, because. Uh, this is something I've been wanting to say about Maddening for a while. It would be so much better of a mode, Maddening mode, if you had a Jagan like Gerald around. If you could just deploy him in the early game maps to babysit you a little bit instead of going through the tedious process of taking out enemies with like three or four at a time. It would make it so much more fun. Like even as like a new game plus unit. Like if he just joined you in the prologue and stayed until he would have to leave, then that would just be fantastic and pretty balanced. And they could definitely balance the stats around him. So, Assuming he's like reasonably strong, I would theoretically put Gerald honestly around here somewhere because Maddening definitely needs some kind of jig and we definitely need Gerald's guidance, but the game just keeps sending him away on other missions and stuff to the point where we can't use him. It really sucks. Like I can understand not getting him in the mock battle. I get that, but I really, really wish we could have him because he even has that stupid blade breaker ability that I think it like debuffs enemies by like 6 strength and 6 defense. That is perfect for setting up kills for your other units. It'd be so nice to have him for a chapter like chapter 5 in the stupid Miklon Tower or even like um, the Red Canyon map early on. Just having another unit to spawn hits because you're so reliant on Boleth and like your main lord to take hits and it's super annoying to have to heal him up every single time because the enemies do so much damage. It would make the game a lot better even if he was just around as a new game plus unit. I would love to have Gerald. Of course, this is all just speculation on a unit that we don't even know what's, what his stats would be exactly. Because they change depending on the mode, of course. And we don't even know what his growth would be. But I think it was planned to be a playable unit at some point, because there's all kind of like leftover data in the game of what his, his crit quotes are like, and his level up quotes, even though we can never level up. I guess crit quotes make sense. I just think, I, I just wanted him to be around, honestly. <laughs> I just wanted him to be around. And then we have Siegfried from The Last Promise. Uh, the Last Promise, technically not a Fire Emblem game. It's a, it's a ROM hack, maybe a Blazer long ago. I streamed it a while ago. Super fun. I recommend anyone who's finished the series or wants to find another Fire Emblem game for them to play to try it out. It has a terrible story, but generally fun gameplay. Not the greatest gameplay, like gameplay on about the level of FE7. So if you enjoy FE7, you'll probably like The Last Promise. That's the, that's the game it's, it's based on, too. And Siegfried is interesting because he is a growth unit. And he has better bases than most people because he's pre-promoted, but the stats don't really hold up in the long term unless you uh, actually give him level ups. The XP gain is better than most pre-promotes in other games because the XP gain in general is pretty damn good in FE, uh, in the last promise. Uh, he has insane growth. I think his HP growth is literally 100% or even higher. And generally he'll get good level ups, so he's like, it's like kind of us like using Shadow Dragon, Setgar, and Wolf in a way. A little worse than that, of course, he doesn't have 150% defense growth, but still. Pretty goddamn good. And uh, the one problem with Siegfried is he joins you in like in what's basically limbo, and it leaves you until about six or seven chapters into the main mode, what's basically Eliwip mode. And in the time it takes him to join, you have like a lot of other units that will level up. But even after rejoining you, I find him very good. There are some people who think he's not even close to the best unit in the game, but I think he's pretty close. He's not available for the entire game, but he is there for most of it to the point where I would be comfortable putting him at least here. At least here somewhere. 
Um, but that's just a little bonus of mine. You can ignore these two if you like. Of course, it's mostly about the main squad. I just thought it'd be funny to include these because they were included in the tier list. So um, that's the whole tier list. That's the whole thing that I got. Let me know what you think. Of course, these are all really good units. So this is mostly talking about details and stuff. Comparing units across games is always a little difficult and it's always going to be, you know, subjective, um, non-objective opinions. But either way, uh, let me know what you would think, what you would do. And of course, let me know what other archetypes you want me to take a look at so I can make a tier list of those as well. There's plenty of them left. So put those down below. Thanks for all the support and I will see you next time. Peace off. Bye.